I'm Brad. Scott. This is Curiosity. We're here with Melanie. Melanie, welcome to the show. We're thrilled to have you here. Thank you. Exciting. I'm psyched to be here. Really thrilled. We've got uh, so many awesome things to jump in and chat about. I don't even know where to start. I always like to start from the beginning, but like, uh, I think it could be helpful if you just kind of tell kind of us what you kind of spend your time on today. You've been working on lots of different things. You're in education, but like, if you can give us like the the 60 second overview of kind of how you're spending your time today. Sure. Um, so I'm president and CEO of Collaborative for Children, and that's my nine to five. And what we essentially do is ensure that children at the onset of their educational journey are prepared and the playing field is level. And so there are lots of children, specifically children of color and children in poverty, who don't get the same opportunities, of course, as their affluent counterparts. And we want to make sure that they have the social emotional learning skills and stimuli, as well as the executive function skills, so that they are ready to, you know, attain those cognitive skills to help them to read and write and then make Houston a better place. That's awesome. Like establish that fair foundation that Absolutely. they can kind of build and work okay. on. Okay. That's amazing <laughs> for so many reasons. <laughs> we awesome. have talked about it on this show multiple times about zero to five and the role that curiosity plays in young humans. That's it. And with the expert here, and by the way, side note, I am so excited about today's episode because <laughs> Melanie is one of the most amazing human beings I've ever met. And I always love our time together. And now that we get to capture one of our conversations in a podcast, y'all, I've been like, I got up so early this morning, so excited, ready to do this. So just throwing that out there, there's gonna be a lot of excitement today. So these young humans, I mean, zero to five, that is when curiosity is on fire. That is when it is just erupting in our being. I mean, everywhere from the, the why questions to touching everything, because everything is brand new for the first time. Absolutely. So like, not only what do you see that as, and eventually I'm going to ask the question around like, how do we maintain that and accelerate that and continue that throughout our human journey? But just kicking it off, like, what's it like to observe that constantly and how does that inspire you yes brad we should all live like we're zero to five years of age yes. because <laughs> the curiosity is on fire no one has been able to squander or squash the organic nature of the human being to be able to wonder and to to test and to problem solve and to make mistakes and no one challenges it because it's like oh that's child's play well, we should all live in the vein of child's play because do you know how far innovation would be and how far we would be along in our society in terms of, you know, um, you know, clean energy and anything that we are facing in this in this current era. We would be so much further along if we were able to just play like children ages birth to five. And so. In terms of brain science, 90% of a child's neural synapses are developed between ages birth through five. And what that means is that while a child's brain is developing through its experiences, it's like a, a, a sponge or a little jello. You know, people always say a sponge, but it's like, it's, it really is um, like a sponge, like a, like a little bowl of jello in your hand. And it develops its patterns by experiences. So if the experiences are very negative, we call them adverse childhood experiences, ACEs. Um, if, the ch if the experience is very negative, then the brain tends to wire itself to defend itself against negative experiences. So when that child goes to school and is preparing to learn, that child is clammed up. They are thinking, flight or flee or fight or flee. They're thinking, let me get out of here. I'm not going to be able to establish rapport with peers or with an adult relationship because I've had to defend myself from the crib till now. But if a child has the ability, which they are naturally designed to be curious and innovative beings, if they're able to make mistakes and problem solve, then they go to school open-minded, let me establish relationships, which is very key, those social emotional skills. Let me, able, let me be able to establish relationships with my peers and with the adults and how do I navigate this environment? That's essential for learning. So curiosity is absolutely fundamental, not only to the experiences that a child has, but it's brain science as well. Hmm. That's amazing. One of the questions that kind of comes to mind as you're talking about that is like, what are some of the 
90% of it is formed like what in, in, in the spirit of like, how do you sort of keep that curiosity, you know, alive? Like, what are some of the features that start to creep in sort of over time in, in that kind of five years and, and beyond that start to like hem that in? Are there like yeah. some kind of key roadblocks or like initial like fence lines that are put up? Yeah, we're the creatures that creep in. The adults are the creatures who creep in. And we want children to have an adult-centric nature. We want them to have adult-centric learning environments, adult-centric schooling, and all of that is theoretically backwards. We want them to sit in little rows like we did as, as, as high schoolers and, and um, collegiate learners and have one teacher on the, the, the sage on the stage basically pouring knowledge into us as opposed to a big learning laboratory, whereas children are able to roam and play and knock things down and build them back up and make mistakes and hurt someone's feelings and then learn how to repair those feelings. That's living. And that's living curiously and uninhibitedly. So that's that's important for the development and the sus sustenance of um, a child's curiosity. So when we think about environment, as a construct, that's a really interesting point. I think that's something to really be honed in on. Because if you look at how, I mean, let's take education as a focus, right? I mean, we can go K through 12 to university to career. The environment does change over time. And I'd imagine that plays a factor. It changes dramatically. I oftentimes liken it to dropping off of a cliff. Um, essentially, <laughs> When children are five years of age and they go from childcare or family's home into school, then they're relegated to walking in lines, hands behind your back, stay straight in the row, sit in the straight row, all of that child's play, if you will, which is essential to every adult being's learning, you know, being curious, being creative, being inventive. Those things are relegated to straight lines and we straight line children and from, from there on out. And then when you get to about eighth grade or middle school, we drop you off of another cliff. Because at that time, middle school, we're saying you're, you're old enough to be responsible. You miss an assignment. You don't bring your pencil or your tools to, to school. You're going to be punished every time you, you, you don't do that because we're trying to prepare you for an adult world. No, that's absolutely backwards. You should be able to make mistakes and we should be able to correct you and discipline you. And I'll tell you this. You know, oftentimes we think discipline means punishment. Mm. Discipline essentially means to teach someone a discipline, teach them a skill set, an alternative skill set to make life better and more prosperous for them. So it's not about go to timeout, stay in from recess, let's pull you off the basketball team. It's about let me help you to navigate what mistakes you've made and to teach you a stronger set of skills to navigate better. That's amazing. I guess I haven't necessarily correlated curiosity to environment, construct, and structure and design. I mean, if we just think about space design for a moment, I think about my own journey, because we typically look at things from our own lived experiences. And from my early career experimentation phase through that journey and how the environment changed and how much I've changed as my environment has changed. Yes. I mean, to give some examples, I was an educator for a handful of years and was in a classroom environment. And I definitely have always been me, for sure, pushing the boundaries has, hasn't been a new emergence of my <laughs> existence. I mean, my, my number one rule, and I taught seventh and eighth grade, in my classroom was be responsible for your own learning. I yes. don't call mom and dad. I want you to choose to be here. I want you to see that you get to be educated rather than you have to be in this classroom. correct. And I really wanted to use intrinsic motivation to inspire them to want to learn. And, you know, some students really believed in it. And there were a handful that kind of called my bluff. And sadly, they didn't pass the class because they did never turn in any work. And they were like, you never told me to. I said, I told you day one. And I told you every week I wasn't going to do that. Like right. I was giving be you total freedom to just kind of live your best life and do whatever you felt was right. And if you chose to sleep every day, and I, I, kind, I kindly <laughs> wanted to discipline rather yes. than whatever the other term for it Correct. is. Like, and I would go up to him and be like, hey, bud, you know, like, you might want to wake up. Like, this is a really cool lesson. We're going to learn some good stuff today. No. Okay. Well, go ahead and keep sleeping. <laughs> I mean, I can't, like, I'm not going to force you. <laughs> right. You've got to, you've got to choose it. And that same student 
I, I remember one in particular, like eventually he was like, oh, he's for real. Like he's really, yes. and all of a sudden he started asking questions. He started raising his hands. He wanted to know what was going on. It was so cool. Beautiful. It was amazing. And, yes. and I, I, have, I have a few like that. Actually, I'll tell one of my favorite stories. This young man, he comes into my class first day, a poor guy. He had been moved to three classrooms because him and his brother were twins, I believe. And they were both in the same class. And then there was a little bit of an issue with one of the teachers. And so he comes over to my classroom. And I mean, he's like, he's in, this is seventh grade. Yes. And this poor young person comes in. I mean, of course, he's like kind of like upset at this point. I don't blame him. And he comes in, lays his head on the desk. And I walk over to him like, hi, you know, what's your name? Nice to meet you. I'm Mr. Rosacci. Which again, I don't know why we call teachers Mr. and Mrs. Like, why don't we just use a first name? That's also kind of weird, just to be clear. But Neither here nor there. Calling you Mr. Rosacci for yeah, the rest of the day. Thanks, right. appreciate it. That's great. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Rosacci. So, so I hand him a piece of paper and a pistol because he didn't have any supplies. Throws it on the ground. Puts his head down. So I pick it up. Like I go, I, I think you dropped this. Throws it on the ground to get wow. it. I'm like, oh, bud, I guess you dropped this. We've looks seen at, that before. Oh right? yeah, this is great. Yeah. He looks at me and he's just like, what is up with this guy? Like, why would he just leave me alone? And so I, at the after class, we had a chat, and man, by the end of the next day. He was writing, he was participating, he was engaged. It was only a day later, just by like giving this person a little bit of attention. Yes. But really putting the onus on them made such made such an impact, I think. Absolutely. So, again, that's my tangent side note. As I said, it was totally going to happen. And, but my time in the classroom. And then when I went into the creative universe, like how much more that changed in, in a studio environment. And then even, you know, in a, in a big brand now, like it's still very much that creative environment. But when I think back to my very early days and we were in cubicles, oh my gosh, that was the most miserable experience yes. I've ever had. That's actually when I went bald. That was, that was, that was the moment. That it was, was the spark. Yeah, right. That was the spark. Not necessarily the cubicles, but that environment was so toxic. Yeah. And I, and the, the physical environment as well as the culture, played such a role in that. Yes. Talk about beating, trying to beat curiosity out of you, which is why I only lasted six months. <laughs> because I was like, this is not going to work. Right. But oh my gosh, this factor between environment and curiosity. I'm, my mind is blown in the best way right now. We just had a neurostorm. Yeah, no, I'm, and I'm, you know, I mentioned, Melanie, that we've got four kids that are kind of, yes. in, our youngest just turned seven uh, earlier this week, and our oldest is turning 14 uh, in a couple of weeks. And so as you're describing, I'm like pouring over like years of like behavior and parenting and like, man, like where did we like blow it? Um, and, <laughs> oh, we all blew it. <laughs> uh, and like where, you know, maybe we're, we're doing all right. And, uh, and so like, I'm kind of interested, I guess, like, and then I want to like kind of go back and uh, ask about kind of how and why you got started in this field and, yes. and would love to kind of explore some of that. But uh, I'm almost it's like I, I'm asking almost for advice, like for parents out there, like in your experience for all the like kids that you've seen and like like and maybe not a specific age group because it's certainly different. But like, yes. given what we're talking about, like these things that are just sort of like naturally imposed by the public school system and kind of all these things, like, are there like a few tips or tricks, like one or two things that if you just kind of incorporated into either home life or encouraged, you know, kids to sort of see, like, are there some things that like would help to kind of steer towards more a, of a, uh, you know, a, a, an open, curious, curious kind of an environment. I don't know if that's like a no, a no, no, absolutely. No, you're you're spot on, Scott. You know, um, I watch our team at Collaborative for Children um, sit down with children on the Collab Lab, which is our mobile school on wheels, and I watch them literally sit for hours with a child, allowing them to take a, something as simple as a race car track and, 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 and put it at the certain incline, right? Mm -hmm. So that the race car will go to, and these are kids who are like nine months, you know, and they're messing up and then they take a block and they lift it at the track a little higher in order for it to roll. But I watch them never, ever give them the answer. Mm -hmm. They will direct them. Well, what do you think happened this time? Let me mm -hmm. give you a few more blocks, you know, so you're, you're coaching intentionally. But children theoretically learn through play. And we try and make them uh, relegated to an adult-centric learning 
environment and an adult-centric pattern. Let them learn through play because that is the way in which they are able to navigate the world in a larger, larger space in a larger way. Um, and also, hmm. it's a way they bring their true essence to a situation. Hmm. It's not you giving them what they should be and, and, and limits to what they should learn and what they should know and how deep their inquiry should go. It's allowing them to just um, to, to manifest, basically, in an environment that you're not giving the answers to them every single time. Yeah. Okay, so there's something really interesting about that. And going back to something you mentioned earlier as well, pre the wonder of environment, but this other idea of conforming mm -hmm. and how we as adults tend to expect children, young humans, to conform to what we understand to be the... I don't know if with the right word, proper constructs of reality and society as we have, as we understand them. That very statement, though, is ripe with orthodoxies, like probably beyond our comprehension. We, we probably couldn't map all of the things that we've believed to be true throughout our development that may or may not be. Correct. And, but therefore, that becomes our bias, that becomes our what good looks like. And then we instill this potentially not actually accurate perception of reality into the lives of the generations to come. And then it becomes this like perpetual cycle. Correct. Which I think I just got like a pit in my stomach as I said that, because it's quite a terrifying thought. Yes. And like there's an opportunity here, I think, to recognize and self-identify with this reality and kind of, you know, like think about, maybe get a little introspective as humans and get under the ice cap and say, whoa, like, why am I expecting these young humans to conform to how I believe reality should be? And instead, just pause for a moment, observe, ask some questions, and just kind of see a child play, to your yes, point. That's like, correct. That was, the, that was the moment for me that sparked when you said that, this idea of just create an environment and a space that isn't defined, but rather that is undefined intentionally and observed to see how the child interacts with the environment, engages with the toys that they're playing with or engages with other children rather than confine that, define that, and then say, it must be this. Correct. Whoa. And then, and there is some coaching, right? Because you're teaching disciplines, you're teaching skill sets, you know, you're teaching how to, you know, build a racetrack at a, a certain incline so that the race car will fall down, you know, will ride down. You're, you're teaching certain things. You're teaching uh, them to the letter A because of something that looks similar to an alphabet in their playing, in their playing field. But um, you're allowing them to inquire and to invent and to mess up on their own. Okay, so then, which leads me to my second question, how do we continue that post five years old? How do we continue that into child development through 18 to 25? I think that's when the frontal lobe is fully formed around 25. Mm -hmm. A little bit later now. It's 25 is, is on average, but they, they're saying now, research is okay. saying they can go a little bit later. Okay. And I'm looking at my sons and I'm thinking, yeah. We, <laughs> There's a test. We case. still have time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mine still, mine still right. may not be fully formed. Yeah, That's yeah. possible. <laughs> um, my 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 junior high students definitely do not have a fully formed <laughs> frontal lobe. Man, if you want if if you want to know what what you really are, you go to a classroom with some seventh and eighth graders, Absolutely. and you will have zero ego. As someone with an eighth grader yeah, and a sixth you, grader in the house, you know, so yeah, know exactly it. where you stand. Nothing in like the middle school. It's amazing. Like there, you you have so much humility coming out of that. It's great. Um, <laughs> Wow, totally lo love. I'm so excited about this conversation. So, how does that then, like, I guess, A, how do we, rather than feel as though we have all the answers, turn on our curiosity and just kind of observe through curiosity and then see what we can learn from the younger humans around us and then adopt and adapt to some of that way of being rather than assuming that we already know and have the right path laid out for them. 
Yes. You know, I often say that if you have not learned as much from raising children as you are teaching them, then you're missing the whole boat. Because the whole dissonance between, you know, a, adults who are trying to mold children in a, an adult-centric environment and, and, um, and the way in which we teach and learn is because we've simply forgotten how amazing it is to be a child. Wow. Because we feel that the journey is to leave childhood. Remember when I become a man, I think like a man, I speak like a man. So mm. we think the journey is to leave childhood and become and what we spend the second half of our life doing is learning who we are and unlearning who they told us to be. Mm. And essentially, it's because we need to focus in or hone in on all the ma amazing gifts and strategies that are inherent in a child being able to learn and grow and develop and prosper on its own. So we spend that second half of our life, as you mentioned, environment. I went into a cubicle and I thought, this is no, this isn't child's play at all. This is too far away. I'm in a box, literally. Uh, and it's not a sandbox, I'm, I'm to a be cog. clear. <laughs> yeah. It's certainly it's not, not a sandbox. A sandbox. That's right. machine. Absolutely. So you're oh, unlearning. I still cringe when I think about it, y'all. It was so, oh man. <laughs> when yes. I graduated from university, I was like, this is definitely not what life is. Absolutely. This is abysmal. And I am not doing this. <laughs> yes, but we teach children all along. You're you're leaving childhood. You're leaving child's play in order to go to something more serious, something and incentivize more incentivize them and that, reward them as they and make reward those steps. them to let go of all of the natural gifts and skills of fact finding on your own and inquiry driven lives. And so then we spend the second half of our, half of our lives going to cubicles saying, man, there's no sandbox here. This I'm getting out of this box. Or I'm going to this next job and this next job because I'm not having any fun. And hmm. if your work and your learning is not fun, it's not natural. So in order to sustain that, we need to allow children to understand that learning is fun and living is fun and exploring hmm. is fun. And don't ever let that go. Oh, I think that's amazing. I, some the statement has been rolling around in my brain as we've been talking, which is not everything that can be measured matters, and not everything that matters can be measured. Absolutely. And what what I'm hearing in some ways is like fun is the metric. That's like right. Is is it's a barometer for if if we're allowing curiosity to sort of persist. Yes. That are we having fun? And there's no like in single definition of fun. It's sort of individually sort of driven. Correct. Um, there's a book on that. A gentleman named, I read in at university, a gentleman named Mike Vec, And he, I think owned a series of minor league baseball teams and maybe managed at the MLB level at some point. I think his family had some role in that over the years from what I remember from the book, I'm going back 15 years. So my brain's trying to remember right now, but it's called fun is good. Mm -hmm. And the whole premise of the book was about the role that fun plays. And apparently he has some notorious moment where like they threw a bunch of vinyl records in a dumpster, like on one of the baseball fields and like literally set it on fire after the game. And, or it was after or before. And I think they had to like cancel the next day or something. I don't remember exactly what happened, but it was pretty intense. And he was like, like fired. I mean, it was like, it was really <laughs> right. wild, but he just had this beautiful philosophy as fun is good. And yeah. now important fun is and like i mean how how often do we ask each other are you having fun like are you enjoying yourself <laughs> right i mean like that's seldom the conversation oh that no we we're have. like it's being an adult must be, be serious down absolutely and, yeah, yeah and it's not only can be measured it's almost like should it even be yeah. yes i mean and then we go oh my gosh now we get to this whole narrative which this this is one of my favorite topics is education and, and so now we get to this whole conversation of like how we measure today test scores yes like what this is so archaic in every way and i understand that there needs to be some way to measure development progress like i i get that some standard yes gives us a benchmark of what good looks like in a balance right we all agree there yeah but yes but i completely disagree with the way that it's being structured today and as you know, as someone who grew up in the education system here in the U.S. and also taught in the education system here in the U.S., I have consistently felt the same way that 
seen a score as representation of knowledge and education is just misaligned. It's very much misaligned. You know, um, we tend to think that, as you mentioned, Scott, you know, there, there are things that you just can't measure. And we tend to pull children off of the, 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 the things that they love and they excel very much. For instance, a child is on the basketball team. You can't play anymore because your score is too low. We're going to have to pull you off. But you're a kinesthetic learner and you're a kinesthetic being and you're mm. excelling in that. And that and you can make a living. I mean, you can you can enjoy life with that. Hmm. But we're saying no, because you didn't do this thing in the way that we and, and meet the number that we had for your success. It measures your success um, and your prosperity. Then we've got to pull you out of the thing that you, you're actually absolutely successful at. And that makes no sense. It's a very punitive environment. It's a very um, punitive way of thinking. It basically narrows you down. And we, we know that. We have so many learning styles. We have so many domains to be proficient in. But then when we get to the school culture and the school environment, we suggest that, you no, know, there's only one way. And that's our way. So you don't get to do all those other things that you excel in. And mm. discipline can still take place if you didn't get that score. And I, I agree. There should be a baseline. There should be some kind of way to measure something. that we're doing what we're doing. But it cannot be the end all be all. It certainly cannot be the metric by which we punish children in order to, to um, indoctrinate them. You know, it's almost like we replace curiosity with fight or flight. And that becomes the standard. It's that us versus them, that fight or flight mindset that's like interwoven in, in the education system today. Yes. And again, I'm very pro-education. I love education. I have so much admiration for it. I want it to be way better because it is yes. so important to society. But there's a difference between being educated and being a lifelong learner and rote memorization. Those That's are not right. the same thing. That's correct. And when you look at how the education system was developed, if I understand correctly, it goes back to the Industrial Revolution and it was designed to produce factory workers. To indoctrinate. Correct. We no longer have that as the primary function of society. There are certain very important parts of society where we have factories and manufacturing, and that's super necessary. Even that's changing dramatically right now. Yes. And so there's a much better way. And as a professional now who has teams of people that you get to work with on a daily basis, you know, we see some of the younger humans coming out of school and like, not only do they a bring a phenomenal point of view that is totally different, Yes. <laughs> but also they they at times have gone through the same education system that we've gone through, but social media and technology have far exceeded our imaginations in many senses. And so they come out, I think almost a little bit confused because they see this beautiful world and so much opportunity. And yet they grew up in this system that they don't even understand a lot of times. Right. Because it hasn't adapted. And yeah. education is one of the slowest. I mean, we we live in the status quo. It's one of the slowest adapting entities on the planet. You know, we, okay. you cannot change the education right. system because we're thinking we, we have short memories. We're thinking about the way in, the ways in which we learned. And we think that that's the only way that one can prosper. Be still. Don't think for yourself. Let someone else pour knowledge into you. Meet the score. And that's learning. And that's not learning. It truly well, isn't. You know, in your example about the basketball player, really, really cool example. That would be like in a let's contextualize it in an adult setting. OK, because you're not a great engineer, but you're really good at design, then you can't design because you're not a great engineer. I mean, it is a good point. Now, obviously, we're talking about being exposed to and learning many subjects yes. as a younger human so that mm -hmm. you are well-rounded. However, it is a really cool point, and it's not a popular point. The right. popular point is, well, they don't deserve to participate in that extracurricular activity because they're not performing in this other area. But the reality is I, we're thinking about it wrong. We should see it holistically Correct. as it is equally as important as every other piece of the curriculum that they're learning. We just, we, we note it in our pre-service teaching training that there are many, many learning styles. Mm. And then we get to the school and we go, nope, there's only one. You're proficient in that one. 
And that's where you will be able to excel in this environment. And then there's certain cultural um, <clears throat> proclivities as well. You know, there's certain cultures that are lively and vibrant and, and children roam, or, you know, around the yard and so forth. And, and then they come to school and they don't fit at all. Mm. And then we find another disciplinary problem. We're like, what's wrong with this child? They're not falling in line. But they're, they're big families come together. Um, they're able to yell and scream and play and eat, not at the table formally, but just kind of run around with the hot dog and what have you. And then we get to school and we go, no, the culture here is sitting still. And the child is so confused. And I do understand for a teacher, you've got to have a standardization as, as to how um, a child doesn't interfere with other people's learning. So they've, they've, they've got to learn how to socialize in that environment. But we don't have to be so rigid, mm -hmm. whereas we don't allow those cultural proclivities to enter that environment as well. For Structured children to yet not, flexible. Yes, bring themselves to that environment mm -hmm. and be able to prosper and launch from where they are. You know, It seems like there's a lot of movements, if you will, that are trying to like chip away at the education system sort of at large. You know, you've got like certainly coming out of COVID, like homeschooling becoming yes. like a much more with, with internet and Zoom and all these things like can access curriculums and things. Correct. Um, you know, I spent some time in the state of New Jersey and what was really fascinating to me is the number of private schools that sort of cropped up because as the sort of core education system was not delivering, yes. people with resources would go and sort of move them into a private school setting. Not that those private schools are even necessarily, you know, addressing these fundamental issues, but you have these more like niche education opportunities. Um, I think back to, you know, I went through the entire uh, public education system, but some of my younger siblings didn't. My mom homeschooled a lot of them. Yes. And so I have siblings that have college degrees that do not have high school diplomas, for example. Right. Because they were educated to the ACT or the SAT yes. to get on to a college track. And I have a brother that started college and he was 15 and a half wow. and just sort of short circuited kind of that whole experience. And just as an aside, he was doing his, uh, we did scouting growing up and he was oh, doing wonderful. his Eagle court of honor kind of, uh, or whatever the, the board where they like discuss That's cool. And like, he wasn't going to graduate from high school and like the, 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 they were having that conversation and like, there was somebody <laughs> on the other side of the table that was like, well, like you need to get a GED or like, right. You need to, and he was like, well, no, I've been ex like, I've, I've accepted to a D one college, like, right. I'm going to college. I don't, I don't need a G and like the, the that conversation like they didn't understand, understand it because it. yeah. it's like this, like you're saying this is the structure this is what we've done this is what this is what yields good outcomes and so i guess like with with all of those kind of resources and things that are out there my point on the private school piece is that it was sort of diluting the the public school effort and yes. i feel like that's like a in some ways i don't want to put words in your mouth but like some of the mission of like building like this this a fairer foundation for those that are in kind of that uh, public school environment. Um, Correct. And I guess what are, I want to form that into a question because it's like, it doesn't seem like that core public education system is, it's ripe for disruption, but it's not likely to be disrupted because it's so ingrained and like it's government driven and there's so many things that like, it's not going to change. And so yes. like, where are the places that it, is changing the most, I guess, in your view, like what are sort of like the weak lines, like the weak spots in the front where like in this battle for like improved education, like, are there, are, are there things that are happening in that core or things that we should be aware of or lean into or help yeah. to amplify? Yeah. I, you know, museums, I, I've just, hmm. I've become fascinated with them. We talk about curiosity and where I began, you know, having this level of curiosity that led me to this career in transformational education. Um, it was when I was growing up in a little small town in the deep South. And basically um, we had schools with very rundown textbooks and things of that nature. And, and, and our teachers were, hmm. Uh, not often highly trained. Um, we 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 did well. We we never had a playground. We never had swing sets or anything mm -hmm. of that nature. We just found a way to meander through the woods that were nearby the school and 
play tag and, and, and figure things out and have imaginations that we were pioneers building a new world and oh all of those great yes. things. Um, so it was a great learning environment, but it wasn't equipped with all the resources that you would find in a, a more affluent school. And where, so I learned to love to explore on that playground, I mean, the woods, which actually was forbidden for us to which was also fun. It was forbidden for us to play there, but <laughs> to be able to out, outsmart the teacher and be in that space was incredible as well. But it was when they said two words, field trip, field trip to the nearby mm. museums where mm. I just felt like learning was the most, have, was taking place in the most incredible laboratory setting than, you know, I would find in school. So Nearby was the George Washington Carver Museum where, you know, you'd wow. see these botanical plants growing in gardens and they were turnips and sweet potatoes that were larger than you'd ever seen in your life. And um, this is as a result of him teaching newly freed slaves how to rotate their crops and and grow plants and vegetables. And then I'd go over to the Booker T. Washington Museum, which is his home, the Oaks. And, you know, he had guests like Mark Twain and and he was a great orator and he was was famous for his debates against W.E.B. Du Bois. So wow. I learned to love literature and, and the spoken word. So and then there's the Tuskegee Airmen's Museum, right here. <laughs> these people weren't the soldiers were not even considered full human beings, you know, um, in wow. terms of society. But here they were fighting for the country and flying an airplane, you know, in enemy territory and being very successful. So. When I think of museums, you can the sky is the limit. And mm -hmm. and I think that if museums would hone in more on making sure that they have age appropriate learning for every member of the household mm -hmm. and that they're able to meet those needs on a more regular basis than you just come in and look and stare and then leave. Um, I think those that's where we will find learning taking place in a more exciting and inventive manner i love that my kids are off school next week you've convinced me to uh take them to, to museums they love the natural history museum oh, and yes. like the van gogh exhibit still out there and yes. so we've been knocking around the kids are all like stressed out because school you know all the tests they had this week yeah and everybody wants to just like lay low but um I'm coming in heavy. Right. <laughs> We're going to go do it. And they'll find that they're they're actually laying low, you know, like because learning doesn't happen from eight to three only. It doesn't stop in a classroom from eight to three. Learning happens all day long, every single day. That's why when people say, well, what's wrong with the education system? There's nothing wrong. Some kids go home to environments that are still conducive for learning. Other kids are, are learning things that are still conducive for learning but may not fit the mold for the formal traditional education setting. Yeah, yeah. So that brings up a really interesting point. I've just been sitting here contemplating this a bit. So like if I think about the, the spirit of our show, Curiosity, right? It does have this kind of like, it's all about the un. It, it has this rebellious undertone in the spirit of it, right? It's, there's a great quote, from a commercial behind the Mac that we've really adopted uh, that says it's a, it's a space for those who can't sit and behave, who'd rather defy the rules and amaze. Yes. And love it. Like that, that is like, I've probably always been a bit of a misfit. I think like, I don't think I've ever really fit in places very well. And I've always kind of in, in as that have stood out a lot and I, uh, and oftentimes that creates a bit of an existential crisis. You feel, you, you just feel like you don't belong. Yes. Right? And throughout my journey as a creative, one of my biggest, I think, inspirations has been to, to kind of intentionally carve that out. Yes. And create really beautiful, magical things because that's where I feel most alive and that's where I feel like I belong and that's where I feel like I can contribute to humanity in the best way. Absolutely. Now, the journey hasn't always been comfortable because- I've always been a little different, mm -hmm. maybe sometimes a lot different. Mm -hmm. um, even amongst my peers, sometimes I'm still looked at like I'm crazy. Amazing. And so, yeah, I, I wish it always felt amazing. But, <laughs> you know, you you either get really cocky, really confident or really humble. Right. <laughs> and sometimes it's a little bit of all of the above. And it's it's what I like to or call crushed. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, yeah. And a little bit crushed. Mm -hmm. And it's like Zen swagger. Humble swagger and bold swagger. And you've got to become a blend of the three, I think. Right. Anyway, all that tangent aside, 
the more I'm thinking about the ideals of this, like take a, take podcasts. There's yes. kind of a podcast for everybody. It's almost like there should be a more customized education system that kind of works for everybody. Like you might, it, it's like microclimates almost. If you think about grapes and think about the region of California, yes. right? We have all these microclimates and certain grapes just grow better in certain climates. Correct. Microcultures is a real thing in, in big brands. There's a lot of microcultures Yes, and you're going to just align better and make a bigger impact in certain environments than others. I think it's, it's equally as relevant education. Like I, before this moment, I'm constantly thinking about, I have been constantly thinking about everything about education needs to change, but that's unfair. It's more a, how do we, it's more of an and I think than an or, or a, but that's correct. And I, this is funny. I want to get this on a t-shirt. It's don't be a, but be an, and, um, <laughs> and one, yeah, one of my co-conspirators and I, I, uh, about a year ago, we're having this like wonderful debate. And I just said, don't be a butt, be an ant. And we just died laughing. It was so <laughs> funny. Um, and so in that spirit, how do we end education more? How do we think about education differently and think about it like almost like the why of education? And so I just like from your perspective, if you had to think about what is the why of education, what is really the root and the big ambition of education? And then how do we customize that for all kinds of kinds. Yes. Uh, you know, it was rooted, education in our American school system was rooted out of the need to control or to teach a certain mindset, patriotism, um, and, and, you know, good values, right? But to make sure that people fell in line more so. And it hasn't changed very much since. So it is about, as we talked about earlier, uh, probably even before the podcast, deconstructing in order to rebuild better. Um, if we keep trying to modify gently, like use another, another curriculum, use another resource or manipulative in a classroom, that's not the modification that we need. We need a modification that modernizes the system that's conducive to digital natives, that is conducive to um, startups and, and children who leave school without the, the high school diploma that no one can understand that the child is already ready for college. You know, we need to be able to think about where we live and how we exist now. And, and that we didn't create this new movement where people are thinking and creative, that it was already upon us. It was inherent upon us. And, and this information age just burst on the scene and made us change as an environment but the school system didn't adapt to it. And so it is about it looking at itself and looking at the environment in which a school exists and deconstructing it in order to build it back better. And then I also want to touch on just, it was interesting when you said, um, Brad, that, you know, I, I grew up and I was different and we're all different. I mean, mm. what kind of world would it be if we were all the same? I love that. And then we take institutions that try and... Um, make sure that we're a monolith, that makes absolutely no sense. We literally are created <laughs> as unique individuals and created in such a way that if we all pull together, that's what communities are, we have stronger communities mm -hmm. because we value the differences in each other. I mean, every single in, you know great human being um, that's well noted from uh, Einstein to Quincy Jones to Justin Bieber all said, I was criticized heavily growing up, you know, because I was too creative for that environment that they wanted to mold me in to be, uh, you know, static. And, and so I think that's another thing in terms of, you know, modernizing the education system. Um, be able to embrace children's natural inclinations that they bring to the classroom. And teachers don't have to be so buttoned up but either. You can have a, a dreadlocked, mm -hmm teacher who uh, plays a guitar on Friday nights in that classroom, shaking things yes. up a bit. You and know? we should have that. Yeah. We, so, we need that diversity absolutely. in the classroom. We don't like, we need less conformity and more diversity and more inclusivity and more equity. Very much so. So it's not just the children. It's, it's who's leading them. Mm -hmm. who's, who's helping to guide them to new disciplines. And if it's someone who thinks that it's just to indoctrinate or to, to mold a child into a straight and narrow, that's got to be shaken up. The hiring process has to be shaken up. 
I mean, it almost goes to, you know, things that we do within the innovation space. When we think about how do we bring the right talent together? How do we create the density? How do we find the resources that we need? How do we make the biggest impact? Like all of these things are very important in this journey to getting to the outcomes that, that, that we really desire and that we want to see happen. That's really fascinating. It's also interesting, just that, that idea of, and you said it really well, modernizing education. I think, again, in my, in my brain, modernizing education has been this like disruptive revolt type of thinking where everything must change. But I, I guess I, I stand very corrected and humble in this moment thinking that's very short-sighted. The better way to think about this is there's a beautiful foundation that has been laid. There's Correct. shoulders of giants that we can build upon. It's not that things are wrong. It's that let's take what's awesome about it and carry that onward and celebrate the legacy of what got us to where we are. Right. And let's and it and let's un it a bit as well. And let's bring forward into what's relevant today and how these young humans learn so that we can ensure that we are learning from them as much as they're learning from us and create a more balanced system and customize learning so that it's relevant to the needs of all kinds of kinds and celebrate that diversity over conformity and say, we can have standards if we design it well. Correct. We can have standards that celebrate diversity over conformity. Yes. Absolutely. I freaking love that. I'm so excited right now. That's and, so beautiful. And it, to me, it just sort of elevates as well. And I mean, we know this, but like the courageous women and men that are out there in the education system that are oh, like right. fighting that good fight, despite yes. like all of the the challenges of just thinking like, uh, <laughs> just like shout out to Mr. Harvey who's my humanities Ooh. high school teacher. Like he's one with like, you know, hair down to his elbows. Oh and yeah. Like yeah. Always, you know, he, he joked his uh, home hot tub he called Walden Pond. Um, and like, you know, he just like, That's just like a, a fascinating individual. Yes. But like, you know, how do those, you know, those people that are out there that are fighting, uh, you know, again, that good fight. I think that that's, uh, I think that's something really special. And I, it kind of leads me to this question that we've kind of chipped away at a little bit, Melanie, but mm -hmm. is like, like, when did you decide, like, what was sort of the moment or if it was a series of moments that like, led you into this vein because you're fighting that fight like you are on the front lines bringing new thought creativity perspective and impacting um so many people here in texas like what what was what's the motivation behind that like what was what was that kind of moment that like hey i'm this is this is what i'm going to do and this is how i'm going to spend my time yeah, outside of, you know, you know, my rearing in a small town and those experiences, when I entered the professional world, I went right into the classroom. And I, I wanted children to have experiences. We, you know, we're talking about the American Revolution. We got down on the floor and built the <laughs> artillery and the <laughs> and the and, and the battlefield, you know, and and lived it out, you know, the red coats against the blue coats. And it was just it, it was amazing for first graders to be able to enact, reenact the American Revolution and everything else that we do. We, would, we had a transportive classroom. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I noticed that when they went to second grade, it wasn't so much that way. And even the teachers, you know, would somewhat roll their eyes at me, you know, like, what's, why is her classroom so loud? Or why is her classroom so, why, the children are never in their desk, you know? <laughs> so I thought, you know what, I, I don't, I don't want to be where I don't belong, but I don't want to enter, you know, I don't want to exit this entity. And I'm with you. It's an and. Children, there should be a moment of, of, of quiet. And we certainly in, engaged in those moments of quiet. There should be an education system founded or rooted in discipline and value-based learning, you know, how to be caring individuals and how to be, you know, concerned for your peers and have to build respectful relationships and rapport with other individuals. But at the same token, it is an and. It is all inclusive. And and my journey was in if this environment has some some great value, I certainly want to go to one where I can take this value and and capitalize on it. And that's why I went to the museums. I went to Space Center Houston as director of education. Um, and, and to me, that was a big giant laboratory. Space, 
I mean, if the sky's the limit, literally, <laughs> that was a place where you could bring students. Um, and I, I focused on outliers like girls, you know, girls are underrepresented in STEM curriculum or STEM careers. So we made sure that we had a program for girls called Diva Design. I think it has since changed its name, but it's still uh, amazing. running it's there awesome. in, oh in Space Center Houston. I'm a, and I'm a, I'm a diva. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Shout out like to this Beyonce. is not a, yeah, I, it's not a, not for tomboys. This is for girls. Yeah, yeah you know, bosses. Exactly. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> Support dope females. Hey. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So, yeah, so it's about outliers. You know, if I'm underperforming in school, I, you know, we took a bus and we brought those students down to school. And rather you be relegated to pull out classrooms where someone wrote memory, drill and kill, you know, you came to the laboratory and you thought like scientists, we put a lab coat on you, put you in the lab and, um, you know, at NASA. And um, you were able to think and, and learn this concept that you missed on the STAR exam in a very creative way, like a gifted and talented student would learn. We often think that a child who's not performing needs to go to a classroom of, of rote memory so they can master the fundamentals um, you, you know, without an inquiry-driven or problem-based uh, learning environment. But if you give them that gifted and talented approach, then everybody rises up, you know? Mm. Yeah. You well, just sort of found that those environments were relative to where you were at before. Like you just had more freedom to yes. own. And then I, I'll never stop ticking people off. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll never that. stop pushing the boundaries. I mean, I, those, I've had an amazing career from Space Center Houston to, um, you know, down at NASA and, and uh, to uh, being president and CEO of the Health Museum and uh, now president and CEO of Collaborative for Children, where we, support, you know, a quarter of the state's children birth to five. Um, but it doesn't come without some bruises because you, if you're trying to transform a system uh, that has systemically left so many of the same population of learners behind, you're going to ruffle some uh, feathers and, and tick some people off, if you will. And I'm not going to stop doing that. You know, there's this axis that I love that I've talked about, which is I was hoping uh, you were gonna share this. willingness to piss people off and giving a shit. <laughs> right. And in that upper quadrant <laughs> is radical candor. Yeah, right. And, and how important that is really for disruption. This. I'm so I excited. love that. <laughs> like I did, I, I didn't necessarily want to tee it up. I was just yes. hoping it was naturally going to happen. I love radical candor. I think yes. it's such a, uh, Scott shared something with me recently that he wrote. And he was talking about radical candor in it. And I was just like, yeah. this is so beautiful. Yes, that's it was, right. It, it's, it's so important. And I, gosh, I mean, there's just, there's so much opportunity space. Instead of maybe the mindset is not like a sense of I'm angry or I'm mad and that's motivating me to want to change the system. It's almost like how do we flip our own thinking to rather just the radical candor mindset, maybe where I'm excited, I'm ambitious. I see the opportunity space here and I'm taking the initiative to go and create that reality. Yes. Yes. That's a very different mindset. And so I guess it's like, wh really, what are our motivations and what's inspiring us onward in order to work toward that? And how do we continue to advance education onward. Right. And I think that spirit of onward, which is a big part of curiosity um, and inspired by Scott's own journeys, is this idea that we just, it's just about staying in motion and continuing to move forward. Yes. But in society, we stagnate instead because that's comfortable and that's familiar. That's right. And so how do we flip our mindset? If we want to do something simple, just continue onward. Yes. And what does it look like to continue onward and never stop? Like it's, there's like, I mean, I, I talk about this a lot in the innovation space. The moment you have summited the mountain, you have not concluded the journey. You have only just begun. Correct. And so how do we continue to begin again and see that the summiting of these mountains in society and the institutions that we have like, are not complete? It is a constant moment of continuation. Because humans have evolved richly and beautifully. And 
we need to make sure that we're always on an evolve. When you're dealing with human services, the human services sector, you should always be in a mode of continuous improvement because they're going to always involve. We are not the homo sapiens uh, that first, you know, were on this planet. We, we've evolved significantly. Mm. And if our institutions don't evolve, evolve with them, then we're, we're limiting society. And that's a, as we kind of wrap up a little bit, like it's kind of a good question of like, what is next? Like, what are the things for, for you, Melanie? I know you're um, tackling a big challenge that's evolving. Like, what are the things that uh, as you look ahead, kind of what's on what's on your horizon? What's kind of the, the next big challenge to tackle? Yeah, well, you know, I've been reading this book called The Disruption Mindset by Lee. And um, one of the key uh, pointers that I take away from that book is, especially as I lead the organization to walk away from significant dollars, you know, in, into an, a curiosity space and um, to be true game changers. Um, you know, the book said, don't look at where you are. Um, successful organizations nowadays look at where the hockey puck is is going. And um, so that's what I'm trying to do is look at where children are. You know, they're they're not fundamentally, especially from birth to five, in childcare centers. That's a very expensive concept. Most children aren't in childcare. Most of the children in Texas are with a family, friend, or neighbor. So I'm trying to find a place where we meet those communities where they are, where, where children are, make it fun for all ages to, because children learn by having guided play through adults, intentional, intentionally guided play. So make it fun for adults to be in this spot with their children to guide their play and th where they don't think of education as this eight to five um, or eight to three o'clock entity. Um, where uh, the learning, the, the real learning takes place, deep learning takes place through play. And uh, if I could just close, you know, Benjamin Franklin says, we don't stop playing because we grow old, but we grow old because we stop playing. So always think of everything that we do in the mindset of play, just like we were born on this earth to play as, as young children. Never stop enjoying what we do, and even when it when we're changing the world, enjoy it. So there's this wonderful book, Magic School Bus, which we all loved and experienced. <laughs> it's crossed my mind in this discussion. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Well, well and <laughs> Melanie, you have created a real Magic School Bus. Thank you. Can you just? I know. I know we need to wrap, but can you, like, in thirty seconds or a minute, explain what that is and how you have talked about? taking technology that's catching up with our imaginations to advance education onward, like you're, you're living it. And so tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yes. Well, um, we, you know, we were often told that there were certain communities that just didn't have the paying clientele for childcare in that community. So they were childcare deserts. And so they said, well, you know, you can't do anything over there in that community and you can't do it historically. They've never had quality education for young children in that community. And I thought, well, then let's just put it on a bus and let's drive it over to them. So we have the collab lab that we drive to Acres Homes, Greens Point, um, Galena Park, and, and to child care centers when parents are coming there to pick up their children after school. We put parent and child on there so both can learn the guided play that's necessary to prepare, prepare their children to be ready for school on day one of kindergarten. So Yes, and it is not filled with a lot of high tech. It's 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 certainly um, a playing ground. You know, it's got it represents a community. Children need to see a community um, environment. You know, that's familiar to them. So it's got the grocery store and the parks and the it's got the space center and all of those things in there. Um, but it doesn't have a whole lot of high tech bells and whistles because it's designed for you to knock things over. It's designed wow. for you to build them back up and be creative. Um, and we want parents to play alongside their children. That's amazing. I How feel, cool is that? That's, that's yeah. so cool. Melanie, this has been fantastic. Oh, Just it's been a joy for really me. Really amazing. Holy cow. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for coming on. Of course. I'm, so, it's my pleasure. So if we close with our question, because yes. now we're doing a question every episode. So what's coming to mind is 
how do we play more? And how do we bring more play and more fun into our daily lives? Like, what would that look like? Yeah. Yes. How do you define fun? Like, how are you bringing more of it in? Yeah. And are you? Ask yourself every day, are you having fun? Yes. I love it. Boom. 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 <laughs> <laughs> All right. That was awesome. Love it. Thank you for listening. Join Brad and Scott next time on the Curiosity Podcast. Curiosity.